Bruce Lawn. Romans 9, you have multiple videos on Romans 9. We got a bunch of folks in here that are like, what about what about Romans 9? What about Romans 9? What about Romans 9? How, how and, and you've done stuff on Romans 9. Mike Winger has done stuff about Romans 9. There's multiple ways that folks have looked at Romans 9. Uh, how, do you, how does Romans 9 work for you? My book, The Potter's Promise, has a large section dedicated specifically to Romans 9. Uh, the debate you referenced earlier was on Romans 9. That's, that's part of the, the book came from the preparation from that debate. Okay. Um, and uh, and so I do recommend for an, an in-depth analysis to go through those resources and to actually look at that. Um, and there's a lot of good resources out there. But what some people do when reading Romans 9 is they'll see the whole Jacob I loved, Esau I hated yep. verse, and they will they will apply that to an individual being chosen for salvation. Jacob is loved before he does anything good or bad, and therefore God chose him for salvation. And Esau, before he did anything good or bad, he was chosen for damnation, and that's why he was hated. And that's the the that's the very low basic view of what Calvinists ultimately take that verse to mean, along with the context of the rest of Romans 9. And we don't believe that's what Paul is getting at when he references Jacob and Esau. Instead, mm. what, what we believe that he's talking about is, as quoted from in Genesis, um, where Rebecca has two nations in her womb, that Jacob is the nation of Israel and Esau is the na nation of the Edomites. And they are representative of those two nations. And God is choosing one brother to be the seed through which his promise would be fulfilled, not the other one. Proving the fact that God's promise has not failed through Israel because not all of Israel is Israel. So just because you are a descendant of Jacob and a descendant of Abraham even, doesn't make you necessarily a part of the ones God chose to be the seed of the Messiah. And so this is about God's choice of people for a service. He has chosen mm. the nation of Israel to bring about his purposes and his plan. And this is a really important aspect when it comes to election. Election is always about God choosing nations or individuals for blessing of everyone else, not to the neglect of everyone else. Wow. So God doesn't choose Israel to the neglect of all the other nations in the world. He chooses Israel to be a blessing to all the other nations of the world. He doesn't choose the prophets to the neglect of all the other people. He chooses the prophets to be messengers and a blessing to all the other people. He doesn't choose apostles to the neglect of all the other people. He chooses apostles to bring a blessing to all the other people because you know, I have four children. So if I chose my oldest kid, Colson, and I said, Colson, I got a plate of cookies. I want you to take these cookies into the living room to your siblings. Mm -hmm. I want you to be a blessing. Now, some may say, well, that's uh, that's favoritism. That's unfair. Yeah, no, I haven't chosen good. to give him the cookies and only him to the neglect mm -hmm. of my three children. I've said, Colson, you are entrusted with bringing the blessing to the, the siblings. Now, oh, that's if Colson took up, if Colson took off up the stairs and tried to keep the cookies for himself, I would intervene and make sure that my promise was fulfilled because I have promised that through you, I'm going to bless all my children. And that's exactly what you see with Jonah, for example. Jonah is told, he's a, he's an Israelite, he's told, go to Nineveh. That's a Gentile nation. He doesn't want to. And God has at his disposal, big storms, big fish, to convince the will, the free will, mind you, of Jonah to make sure his promise is fulfilled. And that's, that's just like a an anecdotal uh, uh, story of Jonah and Nineveh, but it, it really does Israel, represent Israel. Israel is chosen as the nation that God wants to use to bless, to be the mouthpiece for the rest of the world. That's what he says to Abraham, that's that good. through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And so yeah. the, the Rome, if you understand that's what Romans 9 is about, that God is walked, that Paul is walking through this narrative of Jacob and Esau to, to understand the promise that God's made to Israel has not failed it may seem like it because mm -hmm. the Israelites aren't believing, but God is faithful. Even when the Israelites are unbelieving, in, even when they're har hardened in their rebellion, just like Pharaoh was once hardened, God's going to bring about the Passover. He brought about the Passover by hardening Pharaoh, and he's going to bring about the second Passover by hardening Israel. Um, and he's going to bless the, the world through even their rebellious choices. And so it's not about a, a narrowing down of God's mercy or neglecting some people to the benefit of others. It's about God's plan of redemption through the people that he has chosen. In my life, I I would view it like this. I would view it in my life. I definitely believe in election over my salvation uh, based on just 
how God has orchestrated certain details. Uh, I'm a, a refugee from Azerbaijan. Uh, my family applied for asylum in Australia, Israel. We just so happened to end up in America, which was the last place we applied. I grew up in San Diego. In high school, I meet my wife. We, we start dating after high school. We get married, um, so on and so forth. And now looking back, uh, th- it definitely feels like God chose me, like uh, like very very much so. And especially when I have kids, right? Like now that I have a uh, Levi six, Zoe's four weeks old, it, it it's God interweaving that. But I definitely feel like I had responsibility and choice in the matter at the same time with regards to my spouse. For example, there was a moment where I was talking to this other girl and I was at, uh, happened to be at this Christian graduation thing ceremony. And then my wife was supposed to, my, my now wife, meet me at a Starbucks. And I remember feeling there like I had this cross in the road moment where I could either stay to the commitment of going and hanging out with my wife for the first time at Starbucks, or I could stay and talk to this other girl that I was talking to. And in that moment, it just, I remember it so vividly. I remember where I was standing. I chose to go and hang out with my wife. And then that day is when I felt like this was my wife. This is your wife, right? This is, I don't know if it was the Holy Spirit or me or whatever. And now 13 years later, uh, we've been together 17 years that feels like election to me. Is that a is that a reasonable conclusion of like for yeah. the blessing of others? I'm not trying to make myself, uh, you know, the, yeah, the no, Jacob Esau character, I think, right? Like I think I maybe a better, that. a better, you know, better word might be providence of God. Okay, you know, God's hand of providence where He's guiding uh, you in certain ways, and and we we agree with the providence of God. I, I have stories of my life where. Um, if things would have gone a different direction, I easily could have died or could have been with a different person or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, different job, different place. I mean, all of us have stories like that. And we and we reflect upon the providence of God. Some of it's for good and some of it's for bad. I mean, there's some things that we've chosen to do and we think, well, if I'd have gone a different direction, things would be so much better for me. Um, so when you talk about providence, you're talking about the good and the bad. Um, but um, we, we, when we when we talk about election in particular, the doctrine of election mm-hmm. really has to do with the doctrine of 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 God's choosing and His choice in in and through specifically redemption. for salvation. Correct. And so, okay, okay, okay. The the better the best illustration I know is the one that Jesus gave with regard to um, the the wedding feast. Uh, in Matthew 22, and you're probably familiar with it. Um, any churchgoer has heard it before, where the king has a kingdom, uh, and his son is getting married, and he wants to put on a feast, and he sends out invitations to his own people there in his his own country, in the walls of his own country, and many of them stone them the messengers, and you know throw out the invitations, don't want to have anything to do with it. The king is furious. And so he he brings the messengers back together, the 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 servants, and he says, "I want you to take these message these invitations to the highways and the byways, to the good and the bad alike. Invite whosoever will to come." And and the the, the day of the wedding comes, and people begin to show up from everywhere, the good and the bad alike, the 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 people from outside of the the kingdom, and um and there is a person there who's not dressed in the right wedding clothes, and he has them cast out where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And he concludes, many are called, but few are elect, few are chosen. Um, And what I think that indicates is that there's actually four choices taking place here in this narrative. First, there's the king who has his kingdom. That would represent God's choice of Israel. God did choose the nation of Israel. And that's not a that's not a salvific choice. Just Mm. because you're an Israelite doesn't mean you were necessarily saved. But God Mm. did choose the nation of Israel to be the mouthpiece or be the, the, the blessings would come through this nation. And so that's the first choice. The second choice is his servants. So he chooses the people who are going to take the invitation first to his own people and then to the Gentiles. Well, this would represent the prophets and the apostles, because what do the prophets and the apostles do? They take their message first to the Jew and then to the Gentile, Gentile, the power of the gospel first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. And so that's perfectly representative of that. The the third choice is who the message is going to go to. It goes first to the Jew and then to the, the good and the bad alike. And so it's not based upon the morality of the people, whether they get to come to the wedding or not. It's not based upon their lineage, because remember, he says, go outside the city, go outside of Israel to to the invitation. And so notice those first three choices. None of them are soteriological. In other words, none of them have to do with individuals being chosen for salvation. Hmm. It's God's choice of the nation. It's God's choice of his messengers from that nation and God's choice of who the message would be sent to. None of those have anything to do with individuals being chosen effectually for salvation. 
And this is where I think the Calvinist messes up because they just have one doctrine of election, basically, and they make election all about God's choice of certain individuals for salvation. And those first three choices have nothing to do about individuals being chosen for salvation. The last choice is what? Who's going to be granted entrance into the wedding banquet? The mm -hmm. few who are chosen. The few who are chosen are not chosen based upon their morality. They're not cho chosen based upon their lineage. Because remember, it was the good and the bad alike that were invited from outside of the city. And so people are showing up, but only those who are granted entrance are those who are clothed in the right wedding garments, which represents what? being clothed in the righteousness of Christ, as we see in mm. Hebrews. So how does one get into the wedding banquet? By responding to the invitation, which is the gospel, in faith, clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And so the few who are elect are those who are in Christ. That's why it says you're chosen in him. Mm. You're not chosen outside of him. You're chosen in him. So if you're clothed in Christ, then you are a part of the elect insofar as you're connected to the elect one who is Christ. He is the elect one. And so election is about being chosen in Christ. He's the pre-existent one. I didn't exist before the foundation of the world. He couldn't have chosen latent flowers. I didn't exist before the foundation of the world. Yeah. Christ did. Christ is the pre-existent elect one. And I'm only elect insofar as I'm clothed in him. Oh, that's so good. many are called. Many are called, but few are elect. Who are the elect? Those who put their faith in Christ Jesus. So Eesh. any one of you can be elect by simply wow. believing in Christ. Kingstream Entertainment. Bruce Lawn. Joshua the King came down and bore it all. Yeah. Conversations front of the fireplace. All of my mistakes out of wire race. Wanna operate at a higher pace. Birth pains causing the body to dilate. On a first name basis with the world.